I think we are all in. So um, I will start. My name is Maya Mazurkiewicz. Uh, I'm a co-founder and the head of campaigns of Alliance for Europe. And Alliance for Europe is the um, nonprofit organization that uh, works for a better Europe. And we also work on the um, developing tools to support civil society. And we partner up with the public editor, and uh, that is a very, very interesting uh, tool to combat disinformation. And that's what we're going to be talking about, because disinformation, uh, which we've seen already for the past few years, especially. And um, and if if you think about uh, us working in the disinformation field, we see that already for at least 10 years on different uh, areas of disinformation, especially on the social media, including Russia. Um, um different different actions to polarize society but uh, the past uh, two years have been very heavily uh, infected uh, by the disinformation and i think that a lot of uh, people in the public um, public opinion and civil society have seen how disinformation is uh, dangerous especially i'm talking about the pandemic and um, and and currently the, the the war in in Ukraine that is happening and how Russia is as well using this information as part of it, and uh, we're gonna be having a short discussion. So we, we have one hour, uh, and we want to put quite a lot of things in. So the first half an hour will be about a discussion of the issue and of the problem, and maybe already trying to find some challenges towards uh, towards it, some uh, some things of what we can do around it. And then uh, we're going to move uh, to to presenting of the public editor tool and discussing about the public uh, public editor tool with you as well. Uh, but starting with this, I would like to introduce you to our amazing guests. And um, the first one is uh, Sol Perlmutter, a PhD professor at the um, professor at the um, UC Berkeley. To, uh, 2011 Nobel laureate that sharing the prize in physics for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe. And uh, currently he is a professor of physics at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and also a co-director of Public Editor. And our second, um, second guest uh, at the panel today, it's Mike Galsworthy. And Mike Galsworthy is um, also a co-founder and a shareholder of, uh, of Alliance for Europe and director of uh, Scientists for the EU, as well as a director of Violence Network. So uh, we will start with uh, those two uh, amazing gentlemen. Um, and um, uh, Mike, I, I started a bit talking about the disinformation, but you've been doing so much around Brexit referendum and uh, and later working on uh, on the topic of the UK and uh, and we've seen a lot of this information flow in there so like if you can give us the uh, the short keynote on on your approach to disinformation and uh, and what we can do with it um sure well hi everyone and uh, lovely to see you all here i'd like to give you the the view from the uk on disinformation because back in 2015 and 2016 we were hit by quite a lot of it and and were very much unprepared um about how to handle a lot of the dynamics but a lot has actually changed since and i would say that that as a culture in the uk were much more resistant to disinformation uh, online um, from our own government um, and from other sources. So um, to explain to you what that initial disinformation felt like on the receiving end, shall we say, and then how things have changed since, I would like to, um, I'd like to take you back to uh, 2015 or 2016, when the Brexit referendum started. And <clears throat> what you had there was very much um, a campaigning free for all. Usually in the UK, we have general elections every uh, five years or so, four years, five years or so. And, um, and essentially that, that's a standard formula that the parties are competing. We don't usually have referendums this time we had a referendum and the rules weren't really set. And it was at a, at a similar time that you had an explosion of social media and also a lot of interest from a lot of different parties in, in gaming the system. So um, it, at the receiving end, um, it felt very much like 
you were constantly having to run around putting out fires. Um, it felt as though the mission from the campaigners on the other side, and you know it was because they, they've since um, uh, said it about uh, many of their claims, was it was a case of start a fire, and by the time you could go and put it out, they had started five more. Um, and as we know that uh, for one ounce of, um, uh, for, for one piece of BS that gets dropped, it takes 10 times that effort to clear it up. Um, it felt as though there was a complete barrage um, of that coming our way. And this had been built up before the referendum through our, through our tabloid press um, that had set a lot of mood music and agenda around immigration. And in fact, what you'll find is that the public um, uh, attitudes towards immigration are now in a much better place than they were during that time. And that has directly correlated with tabloid coverage of it. But what you had was you had a, a government um, campaigning party for this, other parties for it, and tabloid press, all absolutely barraging it. And what you had in order to resist it was a media that didn't know how to handle this because they'd never dealt with this volume of false claims before. And because you had official parties involved, they didn't want to double guess them. You also had uh, very well put together uh, communities that were more than happy to amplify a lot of these false claims because it suited what they believed. And you also had scenarios whereby false claims that were being cooked up online and then found to be successful would then suddenly spring from that dark world onto the morning radio or onto the morning television from official campaigning voices, catching the mainstream media off guard. So they didn't know that it was actually false or distorted claims. And what you would usually find with, with a lot of the disinformation is that it wasn't um, uh, uh, purely made up, some was, but there was a lot there that was just distorted um, from a, a tiniest grain of truth and then distorted into something. So that actually makes it harder to refute when it is, for example, an exaggeration. And you could say, yes, I know what you're trying to say, but that's an exaggeration. Or when it's outdated. And so you have to provide counter updated information or when it's a quote from an individual and taken to represent a whole group. And this would come as a flood, a flood, a flood. And one of the major weaknesses, like I said, was um, our media's lack of preparedness for that, lack of ability to do research on that and wanting to have balance between two sides. The other problem was, is that you didn't have cohesive communities of resistance. So the Remainers in, in, the, um, in the referendum campaign had not been campaigning on that for years. Um, and so, individuals were scattered and not well formed into communities. What has actually happened since is that um, you have actually had many more communities form during the course of the referendum and after. Those communities have, have developed lots of seasoned veterans um, on a lot of these issues. And because they are communities and they grow bigger and bigger and tend to absorb professionals, but you also have um, dedicated fact-checking resources, usually started off people's own volition, or dedicated news sources, like for example, um, Byline Times that I have worked with, that are dedicated to uh, refuting a lot of this disinformation. And then they become a major source of armament for communities that can resist. So therefore, when disinformation gets put in um, a public online space, uh, like social media, whether it be Twitter or Facebook, you then have representatives of uh, the counter community that can move on it quickly because one of them will know and then lots will see what the rebuttal is. Or should this appear on mainstream media, complaints come quickly into the mainstream media that people weren't called out on this. And mainstream media have now been shamed so many times on it um, that it is in their interests to be more suspicious, 
and um, also to call out um, disinformation fast. And when they do call out disinformation fast, then that tends to do well on social media itself. Uh, but anyway, the UK was, was very much caught in, in a naive place on this, very much exploited. Um, but I would say that the, the, the two major um, pieces that you need to have in resistance are dedicated resources to quickly identify what is disinformation um, and put it straight, and also nurturing of communities who are interested in, in facts um, and the quality of conversation, which will then magnify and disseminate the information that calls out disinformation. Um, and that, to, to <clears throat> wrap up a brief summary, um, is, um, is where I think I'll leave it. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, thank you for uh, showing this perspective from UK and basically very much uh, talking about the communities and how important they are in both actually in spreading this information, but also the ability to, to sort of like give um, this counterbalance uh, to the disinformation. And now I'm looking at Sol because uh, Sol, you have a very uh, specific uh, perspective, right? You're like, we're talking about information and the information is sort of a thing that we would never think that the physicist will, will take uh, uh, take a stand on. Um, so I'd love to hear your approach and how you see and how you 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 work on the on, from the scientific point uh, to actually combat this information, but also uh, why you started to believe that you need to engage, right? And and uh, what happened that that really called you uh, on this side? Because I know that in US, this information really messed up um, a few things as well a couple some years ago. Yeah, no, it's, it's actually a, a fascinating, Mike, Mike, to hear your, your story, um, but, uh, because I, I'm realizing that um, in some ways, uh, uh, you know, UK was a manageable, um, there was a manageable task, it feels like, even rel although I'm sure it doesn't feel like it, even relative to the uh, task that we see in, in the US, where um, it's even, you know, some of the mainstream media, which are propagating, uh, you know, the um, misinformation intentionally, you know, at, at least, at least it so appears, but um, but I think that the reason I, I got interested in all this is uh, coming at it from a, I guess, what a physicist uh, always thinks about the first principles, you know, um, I think I got interested in it because I was uh, wor worried um, what, now a number of years back, even before we saw all the current crises, um, uh, watching our society trying to make decisions and realizing that um, we weren't taking advantage of any of the um, techniques and intellectual approaches that we learned over centuries and decades uh, um, that science had, had provided us, um, that it allowed us ways to be able to recognize where we were making mistakes and the particular traps that we tend to fall into, and then work with each other to keep each other from falling into those traps again. And then we were watching um, our world do what seemed like very practical decision-making, but do it without any of the, um, the ability to think through the problems um, in the way where you would assume that you'll be making mistakes and that the scientists are looking for each other to help you uh, figure out, you know, how you're going wrong, and uh, and and taking advantage of the ways that we would learned to do better. So I got into this in that way because I was originally thinking that uh, maybe we could try to teach each other a little bit more about um, how we can approach problems um, with the assumption that there are things that we've learned to do better, and that we can, and that uh, in problem solving, and and that science has offered us. And um, and so that's one of the ways that we came came into this. Now, another um, fundamental that became very clear as we were watching you know, the, uh, the, the pandemic and, uh, and the earlier periods of politics um, in the US and I think in, 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 the, uh, in the world in general, um, is that we've entered a period in which we're using a new technique for interacting with each other, um, which in principle could make us very collectively smart, that you know, we're now all completely networked on, on, on the web and uh, or you know almost all and you could imagine and I think we all did imagine that that would allow us uh, you know the capability of building on all of each other's um, understanding and intelligence, um, but obviously um, watching what really happened uh, we 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 just threw it all together and didn't think about the fact that you actually need to organize it a little bit um, in order to uh, to get the the positive effect of people being networked whereas it looks. It, often to us now is if we're seeing so much of the negative effects of, of people being networked without that kind of organization. So, um, so I felt that one of the big jobs of our times uh, is for all of us 
um, to be asking what little tricks of the trade, what little techniques can we use that would get a, the collective intelligence of a networked society and networked world um, to be able to use the scientific techniques that we've developed over the years. Um, and that was uh, sort of where I began developing, for example, some courses uh, that, that were teaching the scientific style approach to uh, critical thinking. Um, and we realized that there was just a number of di different ideas that you could teach. Um, and then that's what got um, uh, us and, uh, and, you'll, and you'll meet Nick Adams in, in a few minutes, uh, um, who's uh, co-directing this with me, um, got us into developing public editor, which is a way of seeing whether we can develop the beginnings of the techniques on the web to build collective intelligence uh, on the web that people could trust, where you would see that it doesn't fall into all the uh, traps of echo chambers and people um, assuming that they know the answers, um, but that it allows people to uh, develop some cross, uh, you know, cross party, cross nationality understanding of what are some of the elements that go into a decision or in these cases into news articles. Um, and so I think that was the, uh, the, the starting point here. Um, I, I think the big hope is that um, this will, that this public editor that you'll be hearing about a little bit later, um, it will just be one of many experiments that all of us start to build, um, which will allow people to more effectively work together in a networked world and think through problems together where you're using the best of the people who you disagree with um, in their ability to help you stay honest, and they will be using the best of your um, arguments, and that together um, you'll converge in your understanding of the world rather than the current you know, pol polarizing um, influence of the, of the networked um, com conversation. So maybe that's the, uh, the, the best hope I, I, I can leave us with you know, here, um, that, I, that I think that there are ways that we can do it. And I would say that you know, we've just begun our process of learning how to work in a networked world. And maybe we shouldn't be too disheartened by the fact that, we, uh, that our first try was, I think, a, not, not, not very successful um, and obviously a, a little bit dangerous in, 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 in a number of ways. Um, but I, I don't think it's our last try. I think we, we have, uh, there's much more we can do. And I, and I think there's, uh, you know, there are local uh, abilities to answer immediate problems, but I'm hoping that there's some global abilities um, for us to develop uh, uh, techniques that work in, uh, across many, many problems and across many countries. Thank you very much, Saul. And um, and I think that's that's a bit about accelerating the knowledge, right? Because like, I think the issue is as well that we don't know really how to digest this uh, this information and how to be how to know that we are actually affected by the disinformation. And I would love to uh, actually go into the chat because we already have some questions uh, in. And please, please just uh, add them into the chat. And I'm also happy to to actually um, maybe un uh, unmute you and give you a floor. Um, if you want to talk, so also please please tell me. For now, I will um, I will read the ones that are there. Uh, so so Mike and I'm okay. Uh, I'm not an expert in disinformation. George is saying, but from a technologist uh, perspective, I see at least two major issues: online applications, monetization models, monetizing hits, and B organized propaganda. I think Cambridge Analytica, but there are others. This is going to get a lot worse with audio video fakes becoming persistent in the near future. Uh, Mike, so any take on this? And then there is another one that maybe is actually a bit connected so you can uh, answer it. So many Germans are stepping into the US traps. Why is it? Maybe because they had been debrained by American TV shows and the mainstream media, which are influenced by Big Brother for decades. So I understand there's a lot uh, talking about uh, issues that we are changing our attitudes also due to the TV that is out there and also the information that, uh, that are rather flowing into a very um, kind of simple uh, ways of communication. And uh, so, so Mike Sol, who would like to take over first. Mike? I, I'll, I'll be curious to actually hear Mike, Mike's thought about this uh, as well. I was gonna ask, uh, ask Mike, um, my, my sense is that we, we tried out this world of, of uh, interactive communications. Uh, and by the way, Mike, I'm betting you don't have uh, mute capabilities, right? Uh, yeah. I, I already unmuted him, no worries. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you invited me to answer the question. But you can't and, talk. Uh, whilst, whilst forcibly muting me, which I couldn't <laughs> unmute. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> That's the story that is goes of the bad actors in the disinformation as well. They say that they know. 
We asked Mike for a comment and there was none. <laughs> Clearly, not interested. <laughs> So I, I was going to ask you what, whether you have the impression that I have that um, that we've tried out this this big you know global network communication business where um, but I think we were assuming um, that somehow uh, it would work within this you know relatively commercial model um, and that the commercial model would would somehow you know still bring out all the best of the arguments and people would, would talk to each other. But I think what we ended up seeing was that, um, I don't know whether it was the only commercial model that would work, but you, we certainly got the impression that this particular commercial model that, we, that we've been living with with social media um, tends to um, highlight the, the most extreme positions, uh, whether or not they have any factual basis at all um, you know, in them. And that that's clearly not a, a very strong uh, starting point for getting a good, uh, a, a, development of, of, of really good knowledge and understanding. It, I don't know, did you have that impression? That's... Yeah, so uh, I'll tell you something. Have, have you ever seen a Return to the Forbidden Planet, that old sci-fi film? No, no. Right, okay, so um, it, it's where the, the, these, this group of humans goes and discovers a planet um, where there's already two other humans um, camped out there. And um, they were all living on this planet where there had been an ancient civilization that had mysteriously vanished and they couldn't work out why. And then one of them decides to go into the break, you know, they, they had built all these things and then it collapsed. And one of the humans decided to go into this brain boosting machine. And then suddenly he had a vision of, of why the whole civilization had collapsed. They had built this machine to essentially do anything they wished and anything they thought of. So it, it, it could, um, it powers all these building structures and they thought that it was going to harness all of their intellects in order to build their planet better and more rapidly. But they forgot one thing, said this guy who realized it, monsters from the id. So all of their subconscious uh, vengeances and jealousies that they felt against each other meant that they created these actual monsters which, which had actually been you know terrorizing the humans and they now knew where it came from the machine had read their thoughts but read their under thoughts and created all these monsters of vengeance that went about doing wreckage and it's somewhat like what you create with the internet you think as you were saying Saul that look at this this synaptic connectivity that we are all creating together and through it channels um, all of our fascination with porn and violence and revenge and um, abusing other groups and doing it anonymously and that is actually a larger part of our consciousness and brain and so that's what takes over and the way I think this is all going and the, the question was about you know what do you do with audio fakes and and video deep fakes as well because that's going to make everything worse. I think it is. Um, it is like most things evolving a predator prey relationship. And I think what is likely to happen is that there will be uh, lots of attempts at censorship that, that never fully work. But the audience, that's all of us, will start to learn that there are trusted channels of communication. And being able to build those cross party could be really, really hard. But, but we should be focusing on what are the trusted channels of communication and kind of recognize that the rest is a bit of um, a, a wild west, um, uh, a, a sort of don't go here wilderness. And we should also be pressuring um, the, the platform providers such as Twitter and Facebook and all the rest to load their algorithms to what is calm and constructive and sits in that educational ground rather than, than what also plays on the id and gets bigger views and, and expands the aggressive wastelands. Mike, thank you so much. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna add a bit. Coming from Poland, trusted uh, trusted platforms are very important. But you know we have the issue that, for example, national broadcaster is the one that is spreading the most disinformation uh, in our country, yeah. right? So it's, it's, <laughs> That's also an issue. So you wanted to, to say, I think I have uh, three more questions and then we jump into. Yeah, no, I, I was just gonna come in, uh, well, uh, there's two things. One was I was noticing the question about conspiracy theories and I was just th thinking about the fact that 
Um, there's been a long history of conspiracy theories even before um, the internet. I think the internet just makes it that much easier um, for them both to, to, well, for them to spread, uh, you know, and, and um, but so that's maybe one of the elements I, I, I was thinking about. But, um, but I was also going to just say that I think the, the idea of, uh, of now that we have seen the problem, that we've seen the id being multiplied, you know, et cetera, I, mean, I think it makes it, we're, we're much better, I think, humans at solving problems when we recognize them. And as terrible as it's been to watch the last few years um, and the degree of, you know, of, of misinformation and, and the dangers of coming deep fakes and stuff, I think at least we know what the problem is now in a way that I don't think we did even five years ago. Um, so it gives us, I think, a fighting chance to do something about it. But I think what we, among the things we have to do is we have to start developing techniques for people to have a transparent source of, um, of a trusted, uh, you know, a trusted art, uh, discussion, um, so that those are the things that we would like then the media um, companies and the social media companies to be pointing to. And, uh, and so I think we have to do both things. We have to, you know, get them to point to trusted sources, but we also have to make it clear wh why a trusted source is trusted. You know, and what, how, how can you recognize a trusted source um, and know that it's not, uh, it's not just somebody's point of view? Yeah, and I think that your, the question about the conspiracy theories, like I've, uh, I've been in Ukraine um, during the war right now, and there's like so many of them coming over. And I think that also the fear, whenever it's coming, it's bringing more of those con conspiracy theories, right? And the lack of the, of the proper information. Uh, so I think that you already answered one of the questions uh, that that was uh, from Susanna in here, and I'm just gonna um, uh, take the question flow from Laura and um, and and Ali uh, together, uh, because they are both asking like what actually this information is and how we can um, sort of say, what is this disinformation, right? How we can define it, how we can put actually the, the definition on it, but also how we can be sure that something that we are reading is disinformation, because sometimes this information is not only used by the bad actors, also good. I mean, I think uh, you know later when we talk about public editor, we'll be describing um, one approach. But I think that the the style of approach that we that I think we're looking for are ways in which um, you can find um, across different political positions. You can find uh, that people will agree that you know they may or may not like this particular plan, but this particular fact is nonetheless true, um, and that they will agree about that across you know across different parts of the world, across different political positions. Um, so if you can build platforms where people are looking at, at pieces together and are able to come to, to uh, you know, agreement about those, um, I think that's what you would love to be able to build your, your, uh, your sense of trust on, not just um, you know, trusting some authority. Now, um, it's tricky to do, but the only reason I'm a little bit optimistic about this is because I think when you choose truly random members of the public, they, I, my uh, understanding from experiences like the deliberative polling uh, activities, I don't know if people are familiar with them, where they use actual random sampling, is that the random public is actually much better at having a conversation together and, and, uh, and, and debating and thinking through some problem than the polarized leaders are. And that if you um, were able to build on that, I hope there'd be a source of building trust. Because you know, if, if a, a true random sampling of the population that really represents all different points of view, all agrees, you know, that this part of the story is factual and this part of the story is factual. They may disagree about what the policy should be coming out of it, but they would at least then have a, a basis on which we're, we're starting our, our sense of what's disinformation and what's truth. Very good. Talking, talking like a scientist, so, because uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's just uh, our instincts in science in order to, to find the consensus because then we can all kind of like breathe easy and know that we're we're putting more bricks into the edifice of human knowledge um unfortunately once in a while you you do actually um get individuals who um are very uh, not just unscientific in their thinking and i don't want to pour scorn on people who do the arts and think all about narratives but you get some people um that genuinely see human verbal interchange as a battle of wits, as in kind of like, I am a, a um, knight champion versus you a knight champion. And my goal 
is to defeat you and vanquish you in front of a cheering audience. Right. And I think that it's is the, 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 the team, the team sport problem, you know, that, that people are, yeah. that it doesn't matter what you're, what you're fighting for, um, just as long as your team wins, you know. Yeah, quite. And then, and yeah. then, and then it's um, who crushed who, who had the car crash, who had the car crash, who demolished who. And then this, this tends to get, you know, wildly promoted on, on uh, YouTube, for example. But then, then it has also become, unfortunately, um, a model in the mainstream media in order to keep attention. And we have lost that old way of having two, you know, um, more, more elderly states people having a, a long form discussive chat whereby they say, uh, you know, my good lady, that was an excellent point, but I fear I must disagree on some of the substance. Um, we, we don't do that anymore. And I think a lot of people actually miss that, but there doesn't seem to be uh, an easy and ready-made way in order to build back to that. How do you get the responsible but dull people um, back into, you know, the driving seat of guiding national and international thought. Certainly, um, the European Union very much thought that, well, we'll just collect up a whole load of experts and do experty things and annotate it all in detail, and we will be appreciated for our hard work. But then along comes uh, Brexit and, and, and many other similar drives, which is, boo, look at those boring people over there, those technocrats, those faceless bureaucrats. They don't have the passion that we do for our country. And suddenly, um, you, you know, the, 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 the hardworking clockmakers endeavours get brushed aside because, you know, people want some entertainment too. And they want the simple solutions to politics, especially when they are feeling stressed and thinking that, you know, the, the, the tedious hard work has, has, has brought no fruits. So um, I think that is a struggle which is going to go on and it's going to go on in flux. And I think our best route is probably to identify it as such and just get ready to keep fighting for it down the generations. And I, I think that's a, that's a, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, I, I, you know, I, I think absolutely. I think we're, you know, we'll have to be doing that as well. I'm um, the only thing I was thinking, going to say was that um, I think the reason that I was interested in this uh, idea of, of choosing, of, of getting more representative groups and making them more visible, um, uh, you know, I mean, random sampled groups and making their um, conversations more visible is just because I think we've lost the period in which we can use the, you know, the experts on high telling everybody um, that they've thought about the problem. And I think we now need those experts on high to be um, at least judged by representative, um, uh, you know, random sampling groups so that we uh, have a chance of, of finding out what do reasonable thinking people, people really think when they're not highly motivated to be polarized, you know, when they don't have to show off, uh, you know, their position because they're not going to appear again. You know, they're, they're just the scientists in the mix in chat groups with regular people is a useful thing. So that also scientists aren't looking preachy, but 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 rather but who do we yeah. trust as well? You know, why why would people who trust the scientists? But I think that that's a question that I'm going to go right now to Nick because we we could have talked for hours. But we really want to as well uh, hear Nick Adams as well. And I think that we're going to go back to the discussions. I see some, some more questions in there as well. Uh, but I think it's a really good time right now because we're talking how people could actually approach it. And, uh, and I think that Nick Adams has a very good solution uh, for it. And Nick Adams is the PhD and the founder and the chief scientist of the Goodly Labs and the CEO of Tasli. And he is also a director of the public editor um, and working as well at the University of California, Berkeley. So, uh, Nick, I'm giving the floor, floor to you. You have a presentation. Show us what uh, actually people can do and how we can combat this information as well. What did you... Thank you, Maya. Yeah, thank you. And um, I've really been enjoying the discussion, especially this last part. I, I, I definitely wanted to jump in. So I'm, I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you pulled me in. Um, because I do think there's something there's something we can do besides just having uh, these elites kind of fighting back and forth. Uh, and some of that is certainly a function of the electoral systems, these kind of majoritarian systems. 
um, and a media that uh, is fueled and paid the more attention they grab. Um, there are some real uh, issues working against the notion that we could have a public discourse that is free of disinformation. But there is something that everyday people can do now. Um, and, and it goes back to what Saul was suggesting. How do we figure out a way to amplify um, kind of the careful constructive elements of debate and deliberation and maybe minimize some of that id that Mike was talking about. Um, and I wanna show you public editor because it's a system that's really designed to do that. And it's something that people here on the call can use and uh, you know, millions of people across the land uh, can use. So let me go ahead and share my screen and give you a sense of how public editor works. Um, do we see a little slideshow? I hope so. Yep, yep. Um, so the, the problem we're confronting is probably not new. There's probably been fake news as long as there has been news, but we have an information ecosystem now that includes 2 billion amateur publishers. And if I send something through Facebook or Twitter, my friends and family kind of assume that it must be correct. And we're all kind of doing this to each other. We're, we're passing uh, garbage information along um, and, and we've really got a, a situation that's out of hand. But we think it's possible to have a solution where when you're reading through your newsfeed, you can kind of see immediately um, that some articles have higher scores than others. Some might be more credible than others. So here we see an article with a 98 right next to one with a 65. These are scored out of 100 in the public editor system. Um, and then when you're in an article, when you're inside of an article, you can see even more information about the, um, how it might be misconstruing uh, facts or it might use poor reasoning. So I'm in an article now. This is one that's actually been scored by the public editor system. We have this credibility hallmark um, that you can navigate. So we see that 18 points have been removed for reasoning errors. And I can click on these little wedges and I can find an example of stereotyping, an example of a bogus assumption, an example of availability bias. Um, a red herring or distraction, personal ad on hominem attack. So I can kind of scan through this article and learn the different ways that we humans fool ourselves. Um, and as I read this article, you know, I immediately see that it has 60 out of 100. This is not a very credible article. Um, and as I go, I can see the different errors and the points that are being deducted because of these errors. Um, so as a reader, I'm not getting fooled in the first place, but if I re end up reading, you know, many dozens or hundreds of articles over a few months, I'm also going to learn about all these different types of errors that humans make, whether intentional or not. Um, so we kind of distinguish between disinformation and misinformation just by the intent. If, if someone's intentionally misinforming, it's disinformation, but there's all kinds of accidental ways we misinform. And fortunately, public editor picks up all of these. Um, we did a test with the EU versus Disinfo team. And that's a, that's a set of experts that do fact checking on, uh, on primarily Russian propaganda, but various state sponsored propaganda. And um, in a hundred percent of the articles we did, uh, news readers felt like we gave really useful information. In 94% of articles, we identified the same disinformation that the experts had. And in 86% of the articles, we identified additional misinformation that the experts had not identified. Um, and when we identify this information, this misinformation and disinformation, it's not, you know, it's not just a paragraph off to the right or down at the bottom. Um, it's right there labeled onto the text so that people are, are getting a bit of doubt as they're reading. Um, what I wanna do next is show you how this system works. So how do we get all these labels on these articles? Uh, the answer is not AI um, because AI is still not advanced enough to recognize things like sarcasm and metaphor, much less uh, ignoring selection effects or a false dilemma. Um, so we actually have a human process to annotate the articles and that human process ensures that we can pick up very nuanced misinformation. It also gets people 
in on the loop. Uh, it gets humans in on the process so that we're actually training up a larger set of people who have this sort of scientific critical thinking um, capacity that Saul was talking about. So we start with an article uh, here at the top of this diagram. And what we do with Public Editor is we take the articles that are already going viral, the articles that um, are already seeing millions of eyeballs, and we make sure that we're going to evaluate those. And there are two different stages of annotation. In the first stage, we call this the triage stage, where it's the job of the annotator just to find different chunks of text, um, maybe the formal elements of the text, documents and quoted sources, or maybe they're looking for chunks of text that are relevant to the different semantic features of the article. Uh, so they might be looking for places where evidence is used or where the language looks like it could be uh, a little bit slanted. Um, or they're looking for places where probabilistic reasoning is used. And then they'll send those chunks of text along to a second set of annotators here in stage two, which are gonna do a very focused task to um, evaluate the quality of the reasoning or maybe the quality of the evidence, um, the relevance of the argument to the overall article, et cetera. Let me give you a sense of what that looks like for an annotator. Um, here is a task where an annotator is going to look for areas in the text with probabilistic reasoning, with potential language issues, um, with known reasoning fallacies, or places where evidence is being used in the article. Um, and as you see, if I click on these different tabs, I can get specific instructions about what I'm looking for. So for this particular article, um, I've seen this one before, I'll go fast. There's some evidence being used. Uh, there's a probabilistic statement here about, um, oops, sorry, about uh, some election being a toss up. And then there's also some, some stuff up here where one candidate is referring to another one as cult-like, which seems like a sort of an exaggeration. Um, if I'm doing this task for public editor, it's not my job to evaluate how, how bad this exaggeration is or even to call it an exaggeration. It's just my job at this stage of annotation to pass it along to someone else. Um, so we can see I was just doing a, a, semantic, a semantics triage task and I was passing along these little chunks of text to a next set of people. Um, and let me show you what that looks like. So here is a language task. And the, what I highlighted for language and potential exaggeration is now being passed on to a next set of annotators. And their job is to answer questions about the text that was highlighted. Um, we have a little slider here so someone can read the full article if they need extra context, but the instructions here tell them to focus on the bolded text at the left. If you have been subjected to the British Imperial School System, and most of you have, you've seen tasks like this before. You've done tasks like this thousands of times. They call it a reading comprehension task here in the US. Um, and as I answer these questions, there's just one different from what I've already done 50,000 times in school. When I check an answer, I'm also prompted with this little inkwell to highlight the text that justifies my answer. So I would end up doing this task and I would I would highlight this stuff about cult-like because you know politicians can always call each other cult leaders. It's a, it seems like a bit of an exaggeration. Um, and if I click next, I have a follow-up question about how bad the exaggeration was. And here I can give my judgment that this is a considerable misrepresentation. Um, but when I'm doing this task, there are always at least two other people doing the very same task independently, and we can find the consensus among the people who are doing the task. Um, so some people might say it's enormous, some people might say it's only some or minor, and our, our system will automatically find the consensus. If the answer choices are kind of categorical, like you know, cat, dog, turtle, we won't be finding an average, we'll just be looking for like a single um, large spike in a distribution. But wherever there is a consensus, and we have these attached labels that are relevant to the answer, um, we then have a label that we can publish 
um, on the article. So everything you're seeing here, this writing errors, mistake, uh, these bogus assumptions, stereotyping, personal attack, all of these things were developed by a consensus of annotators working independently um, on, on a narrow task like this, where they're just focused on a piece of the bold text and answering a set of questions. Um, we also look for anything that's great in the article. Uh, so we're not just dinging people, we're also giving them uh, giving them props when they do a good job. In this case, not, not particularly a great job. Um, and I would finish this task and I'd go on to a similar task like this. Uh, in the system, we have tasks where we are evaluating evidence. Do we get very deep into that? So we're looking for um, correlation versus causation. Um, when we're looking at probability, we're looking at sample sizes. It, it, the, the scientific level of rigor is pretty high. And what we're able to do, like I said, uh, based on our test against articles also evaluated by the EU versus Disinfo, we're able to find a very high percentage of the misinformation and disinformation in articles because so much of so much of that misinformation and disinformation shows up as reasoning errors, as inferential mistakes or cognitive biases or exaggerations and rhetorical tricks. Um, so it's very hard actually out in the wild to find an article that just has false facts and everything else is, uh, is really clean and the reasoning is very sound and dry. Um, so what we, the one thing that, you know, I think is really amazing about the system is we are being inundated with misinformation and disinformation around the world. Um, it's great for the platforms, they make more money. It's great for uh, political parties that see, uh, that see like, community uh, deliberation as information warfare. Um, but with public editor, we can also take every single, you know, almost all of this misinformation and we can turn it into learning opportunities. So as you're reading the news, you're getting smarter. If you're participating in the annotation tasks of public editor, um, you're going to be one of the, you know, one of the sharpest people out there. Um, I do these tasks and they're like a great little brain teaser they wake up my brain. Um, I feel a little sense of accomplishment, and and this is something that everyone can get in on. So let me let me pause there, and we can have a little more discussion and questions. Nick, and I understand that this is the part uh, of the training, right, that the public ed editor is giving, uh, that uh, that you showed, and that everyone can in enroll in, and moreover, after finishing it, can get uh, the certificate from the Berkeley Institute, right? So I that's, think that's right. So, well. yeah, I should should have mentioned that. Um, uh, it, this is not just a, a general thing that you can join, but actually, starting in a week, we'll be launching um, we'll be launching a, a demonstration project in Europe, um, and we want to see as many of you as possible join and give it a try. So we'll be training you on how to do some of the simpler tasks, uh, and then we'll people do tasks for about three weeks. We're looking at about three hours per week, over three weeks. Um, and you'll learn more about how to do the task, but we're also going to learn a little bit about uh, how to incentivize the annotators. We have a little bit of gamification in our system uh, where people can earn badges or they can compete. And we want to learn a little bit about what makes our annotators happy. Uh, so if you have an interest in this, uh, we would really love to have to have your help, and we can we can learn more about how to improve the system and make it as fun as possible. Nick, and uh, it's so basically it also definitely helps people to understand what disinformation is and how basically are also misinformation in fact and how it can work, uh, and how we can be resilient to it as as humans, right? Because going through this um, uh, this uh, this process and this training, you really kind of learn how to digest the information better. Uh, while reading social media or news in general, uh, as in there is uh, some of those uh, media as well. Does it also work with the bad actors? Because I think that we talk quite a lot about the bad actors, especially those that, for example, can be governments. Are there any uh, particular um, points that, that you do with the public editor on this? Yeah, so two things. I mean, there, there are two kinds of bad actors that, that we worry about and have designed the system to uh, counteract. One is, um, and maybe this is really important to some members of the audience, is 
um, people who want to join our team and then and then perform poorly. Um, that would be a that would be a big problem uh, if if the system were overrun with what what we call trolls. Um, but fortunately, we've got some really great design elements to to block that. The, the first thing is that uh, if if you were a troll who wanted to uh, change the outcome of an article's credibility score, um, you would actually have to get a bunch of people to do it with you because every because we don't there's no one person that has a large impact on uh, the labeling of an article or the scoring of an article. This is always a team process, a minimum of about 42 people involved in the scoring of any one article. Um, and, they so, don't, and, they don't, uh, and they don't get to choose the article that they're gonna score. That's right. They don't get to choose the article that they're going to work on. They don't get to choose the tasks that they're doing. Um, and then you also have the tasks are kind of broken down. And uh, it's, so it's not, someone is not applying their kind of overall biases and judgments to an article, they're focusing on a little piece of the article. Um, and also as people work through the system over time, they learn more and more how to evaluate this stuff uh, using the protocols that, that we've defined. And what we, what we found with annotators is, this is really interesting. Annotators, when they're doing the work, they actually get most annoyed at the people who share their position, but have a poor argument for the position. Um, I've known this since I was in high school debate. Like the worst, the worst thing is not your opponent with a bad argument. The worst thing is someone on your side with a bad argument. Um, and so we actually see in kind of the culture of the annotators themselves that they want to see high quality, higher quality information from all sides, um, but maybe especially their own side. I, I, um, I have a question on that, on the, because. Yeah. It's based on inter-rater reliability, which, which I'm a big fan of. Um, and if you've got so many people um, agreeing or disagreeing on different aspects, out of all the errors that you could make, what are the ones that people most agree on in terms of type? And what are the ones that people um, are most at variance on? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so each prompt, each little question in the system uh, can be rated according to this measure Mike points out of inner rate of reliability or your different Trippendorf's alpha uh, measurements if, for anyone who wants to nerd out on, on how those work. Um, and one of the things we do, Mike, is we kind of scan the system to see which prompts have the highest inter rate of reliability and which have the lowest. And we often find that those that have the lowest, we need to make a little edit to, to the prompt. Um, we're, we're asking them to look for you know, different rhetorical flourishes and, and the way we've categorized them is a little bit unclear or ambiguous or something like that. Um, so we're constantly kind of scanning for uh, ways to improve the system. It's, it's working out pretty well, but uh, but we're going to keep it. Probably it. to tidy up clarification of interpretation for those people who are actually trying to use it. Yeah, so, so we right. have as well a, a question from Christina Wilford. Uh, how can we okay. take into account gender disinformation in the system? She is the researcher and co-founder of She Persisted, um, where they are bringing attention to attacks on women leaders, which fall into false but largely unprovable attacks um, that tap into unconscious bias. Very hard to debunk mm -hmm. in this form. Um, so the same can be said also for racially loaded misinformation and so on and so forth. So, so do, you, do you have a solution for this also in here? Uh, I think that's incredibly important work. Um, in our first iterations of Public Editor, we've been focusing on, on misinformation that kind of uh, fits this model from Saul's course, you know, misinformation where there's a failure of scientific inference or a failure of reasoning. Um, we do have uh, labels for stereotyping. A lot of the biases that come out as gender or racial discrimination are actually um, a more general bias, a more general cognitive bias that we identify in the system. Um, we could certainly add things to the system. This annotation platform that's underlying public editor is very easy to customize. Um, so, you know, what we'll be doing as we kind of launch public editor in various communities 
over the next year, uh, you know, we'll be learning about gaps and ways that we can improve it. So I would invite Christina to, to reach out um, and we'd love to show her some of our initial results and see if there are ways we can um, do a better job of confronting that particular type of misinformation. Thank you. We have also a very interesting one from Daniel from Munich. Uh, for you, it seems really easy to distinguish good and evil. And I think that it's kind of a question that pops up uh, a lot while we are talking about disinformation. So <laughs> what would you say? Um, I, 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 I mean, I would not, uh, I would not say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use those categories. Uh, I wouldn't say those categories are so incredibly clear. Um, I think a lot of times people who are putting out misinformation are doing it unintentionally. I think even people putting out disinformation might think that it's serving a higher purpose. Um, so it, it's not necessary for us to call some people evil and call some people good. What we're really focused on is how the thinking is unfolding on the page. Um, and this is a really important point. I think a lot of times when people engage with the misinformation, disinformation problem and the debates around it, um, there's a lot of talk about, well, what are people saying? What is the content? Or there's a lot of talk about who is saying it? What is their expertise? And I think something we need to be focusing on, you know, as our societies or civilization or however we want to um, imagine ourselves, we really need to be focusing on the how, of how do we think? How does that thinking unfold on the page? How do we think together? How do we evaluate uh, the utility and the truth value of different claims? Um, and is there a way, and we believe there is, is there a way to do that systematically, transparently, in a way that engages a lot of people so that as a society, we're kind of getting you know, this meta brain or this over brain, this collective intelligence um, that allows you know, the millions of us to be smarter than just one. Person. Susanna, right, back yeah, to sorry, just something for one second. I, I realized I, I actually need to go on to another presentation. I'm supposed to be going to uh, to be, be away, so I, I was going to thank you for having uh, having me on. But um, but I was just going to leave uh, you know, with the thought that um, I think what the, this public editor concept that Nick's describing um, that one of the things that's so uh, appealing about it is that it does allow us um, afterwards to just show uh, the public um, a a way of, of proceeding and and allow them. Transparently to see um, that you know these various different scores that he was showing, for example, are um, the product of people who disagree with each other on many political positions. But we choose the scores when they agree on a on on this one particular point that these that the, that this issue is there or not there in the article that they're uh, that they're studying. So um, we we see it as at least a exploration of, a, of an approach to trust building that um, that may not be uh, you know obvious. And, we, and I, I think we really hope that people will join us um, in, in the experiment this time around and, uh, and maybe do, we can all do better with it. Thank you so much, Sol. Thank you for being here. And I definitely encourage everyone to joining as well. I think I'm gonna just go for the last round uh, of the questions. We're gonna be finishing the event, so thank you. Um, and uh, with this, uh, with this uh, follow-up question, it's actually Susanna that is uh, asking whether is there's an uh, old um, solution uh, um, for the disinformation or fighting disinformation that is more quality information, more civic education at schools. But we are actually with the with the public editor in here. We also talking about in education, right? So like those those solutions are needed, but I guess that there are more long-term solutions, and that's what we are also advocating for uh, within Alliance for Europe. Um, but with the public editor, it's like something that really you can go online and engage and start to uh, gather other people on board. So Mike, like what is your uh, thinking if you, you know, listening about the public editor, seeing it and, and thinking like, whoa, if that would happen a few years before a Brexit, that would, um, be, that would be much better in UK or whatever. Yeah, certainly. I, I think we need to develop a culture in general um, of calling out rubbish on the basis of, of it being rubbish, um, including, most importantly, on our own side, um, which I think some people do, but we, but we need to push a little harder to get that into our own culture of don't let the side down. You know that was a sloppy argument. Um, and I think that, that resources like this are very, very useful um, in starting that culture, you know, how, however 
however small it may start, just having a place where you go to and say, right, this is the way that you go through a piece of work and this is how you think about it. And having training like that, I mean, we, with the Bylines Network that we run, which is eight regional publications, um, I see Vipka, one of our editors in chief uh, on here just now, I would very much like the editors in chief to have a look at this and, and open it up also to all of the students that we are bringing in onto the program uh, up in, into our network from universities on, on student placements, formal student placements. This is the kind of training that we could offer them because they are, they are student journalists wanting to go on in their careers. This would be a great thing that we could offer were we to do a partnership on it. So I think that's the kind of level, it, it, the citizen journalism level and, and the young being initiated journalists level, if you can start weaving that into the culture as well, while creating wider awareness of this and start putting, you know, um, fact scores and sort of reasonableness scores on articles too, then uh, people are, will be aware that it's there and people won't want to mess up on those. So I do think that this is um, a very productive um, tool that needs to be built upon. Perfect, thank you very much. It's great to hear that, right? I mean, Nick, you're like, yes. <laughs> I'm sure that you knew that, but like hearing it from Mike even well, much, better, much better. Yeah, so uh, please, yes, Mike, connect totally. us. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Great, Mike, you just need to share it as well. I get it. <laughs> Nick, uh, please, uh, the last uh, last few sentences uh, to the audience in here. What do you, do you like to ask? Well, I, 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 I just want to thank everyone for, for coming. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of care about this issue uh, here in the room. And starting in a week, um, we're, we'll be inviting people to jump in on the system. Um, like I said, it's, it's a commitment of about three hours a week for the for three weeks uh, once we start. Um, and that'll give us a bunch of information about how to improve the system, but it'll also give all of you an experience working with it and, and get you on your way, kind of learning these over 40 different types of reasoning errors and inferential mistakes and cognitive biases that we humans make to fool ourselves. Um, you can also earn a certificate from the UC Berkeley Institute for Data Science if people are interested in that. Um, but but overall, I, I'm I'm hopeful. You know, we've been we've been building this for a while now. We've been iterating. And we've on our we're on our fourth iteration of it, um, improving it as we go. And um, I, I believe it's really needed in the world. And and to see some people engaging, even to come today. Uh, it just gives me a sense of hope that there are there are people out there who, um, you know, instead of doing the Sudoku or the Wordle or the crossword, they might start doing tasks on Public Editor, um, and it'll be just as intellectually satisfying, just as good a warm up of your brain for the day, but it can actually have a huge social impact, uh, cleaning up our collective conversations and raising uh, the level uh, um, of the discourse. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Nick. Thank you very much, Mike, for being here. And thank you all for, for coming. We, we're gonna be following, following up with you and you're gonna be getting the onboarding messages uh, for the public editor training as well next week. And, um, and from what I see, because there's so many questions as well and such a great conversation on the chat, is that uh, that I think that we've, with a team we will need to just do more uh, more discussions about it because uh, I think it's a very uh, valid uh, valid topic and topic that we uh, definitely um, need to discuss more. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here, spending uh, the evening with us, um, and you're here from us. <laughs>